the sustainability management master's program you are answering one simple question do you care about your future generation you know if you care about your kids their kids their grandkids then you care about sustainability and a sustainability manager is someone who has the tools to make people understand how they can contribute towards developing a sustainable world we have both part time and full time students our curriculum is 30 hours instead of thesis we have a research project course and a seminar course which provides them with the kind of research background they will need to be successful in their job at the same time sustainability is not always everything about environment it also relates to the business they will take a sustainable business strategies course they will take a project management course most of these courses are going to be taught by industry people the people who are doing sustainability on a daily basis as a part of their job any organization that has a large number of employees and has a physical infrastructure they will have to have a sustainability office if you have the passion to develop and maintain a sustainable world come to us and we will help you shape your passion into a career which will create an impact Thank you for the introduction, Dibs. I um, have been here at Stevens for about three years now. I am actually a coastal ecologist working in the engineering department. Has anyone actually ever taken an ecology class? Oh, yes, that means I get to tell you things and you won't know if I'm right or wrong. Um, so, <laughs> we, I was brought into this department because I am an ecologist and when Dr. John Miller started working on living shorelines, they realized they were combining, hey Philip, Uh, you can move my stuff if you want to sit there and take that chair just sit on the floor. Um, so they realized the combination of li living shorelines is a combination of hybrid structures between engineered structures and then coastal ecology aspects such as where animals are going to live, what plants might live in the area. So every time they had questions about living shorelines in the ecology section, they had to go out of Stevens and ask someone else. Um, call one of our partners at the Partnership of Delaware Estuaries or someone at Barnegat Bay Partnership. So they decided that they needed someone like me. So luckily I had met John and uh, Tom Harrington a while back and they kind of kept me in their minds and said, hey, we, we need someone that does ecology and can teach and talk to people and do outreach. So let's see if we can bring you on and we can work together. So it was pretty interesting because some of the reports that we would do, I would see them and they'd be like, um, we need your help answering some of these these things about the environment and would be like what types of plants are there and they would answer trees or grass like very very general and I'm like wait 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 we need to narrow this down a little bit um, so they joke they say I do the green fluffy stuff um, but I still have been working with a lot of the engineering practices and I'm trying to learn some of their terminology as they try and learn some of mine as Dibs mentioned I do work also at Sandy Hook it is a beautiful place it's a a uh, spit, an island, or not an island spit, but a peninsula or spit off of the coast of New Jersey here. And this is the old building, it's part of the Fort Hancock National Reserve there that was, it's a historical site, so it's old buildings renovated and made into our lab. Um, we work on sustainable and resilience, uh, resilient ecosystems. We look at different practices such as how to make a coastal coastline more resilient after storms. Um, we've been seeing a lot of storms this year, so we're getting a lot of input from other places where this is happening. New Jersey Sea Grant is part of a larger Sea Grant program that's all over the United States. Um, and then also, of course, I live right here. You guys know this area. And have any of you ever been down in the bottom of the Davidson Laboratory? I know you have. Lucas might have. <laughs> few of you. So you've seen that we have uh, one of the longest wave tanks there. I think it's 316 feet. We're not sure where the 16 came from. You have any clue? Nope. <laughs> uh, but huge wave tanks. So sometimes while I'm doing my work, I can hear them yelling and shouting in the wave tank moving under there. And they're, they're doing some projects under there. So I split my time in between these areas and anywhere from Cape May up to Sandy Hook and then all the way up the Hudson River where we're working on projects. Over at uh, the Davidson Laboratory, we have our coastal lab group, um, Stevens Coastal Research Group, and we're working on a bunch of different projects, and I'm going to be going over some of these today, um, some in more detail than others. We get some fun, cool toys that we get to take out to really cool areas. Uh, I kind of got pulled into this just because I love the beach. 
Um, I started doing marine science when I was back at Rutgers. I ended up studying abroad in Australia. I got my scuba certification. I said I want to do more of this for my job. I don't want to always be in an office. And so days like this when we're in the field, I was just in the field on Monday for about 15 hours, which sounds like a very long day, and it is, um, but it's also a lot of fun to be out there. So we have an ATV, a, a jet ski, we have a GPS units that we take different elevations of the beaches and then the bathymetry, the ocean under the beach. We do rip current awareness and rip current science. So these are drifters, so basically big buoys with GPSs on there that we put on the ocean when we see how the water is moving around. And um, this is really fun on a day like today, but we also do this when our nor'easters come in. When do they mainly come in? What month? Come on. What month? Uh, yeah, during the winter, we have to do the same work and go out way deep in the winter into the ocean, and uh, it's quite cold, but still, it's better than being in the office. So a lot of the work that I work on has been work that's come in through Stevens since Superstorm Sandy. Superstorm Sandy is something that has affected our whole entire coastal area. It has also brought in a lot of grants and money to look at how can we be more resilient to the next time we have a storm like this. Now, we have a couple of different processes that go on on our shorelines. We have processes that are historical processes that are happening constantly, such as things like sea level rise. That's going to continue to happen over a long span of time. We have processes like nor'easters and storms that happen once, twice, maybe a couple of times, but they're called episodic events. When they happen, it's usually something that we need to prepare for a little bit differently than how we do our, our general climate change. So we normally get about three or four nor'easters during the year in New Jersey, but things like Hurricane Sandy, we might not get um, for a couple of years, a couple of 30, 40 years. The last big storm was in the 1990s, uh, and then the one before that was the 1960s, when you hear about different major storm damages on the Jersey coast. And then we have 2012 when Hurricane Sandy hit. And anyone here was still here? Was or a lot of, how many people were here when Sandy hit or somewhere in New Jersey? All right, so you, you know what happened. You saw the flooding. You saw the coastal surge. You probably watched the reports coming in. One of the major things with Hurricane Sandy is the wind speeds dropped before it hit New Jersey. However, the storm surge still was pushing through, still pushing all that water column up into the areas. So storm surge and flooding were our major issues. Not so much wind damage um, down in what's happening in Puerto Rico has been a lot of wind damage down there, uh, but we got the storm surge. And so here's one of the tide gauges that we have that went through with Sandy. And you can see over here, this is what your, uh, oh, it won't show up, okay. But this is all before Sandy, where our normal high and low tides are. And then as Sandy hit before we lost the data, the tides and the storm were pushing the water way up into the severe flooding areas. So. Sandy definitely caused major damage. However, it also caused an influx of grants and money and an interest to study these things more in depth. So some of the stuff that we, we received here at Stevens was money to look at federal, um, the beach nourishment projects. So look at how are the beaches moving around? Where are we putting the sand? How are these things reacting um, to new coastal processes occurring? We also got a grant to work on a dune manual. So New Jersey Sea Grant Consortium had a group of collaborative experts work on how should we put our dunes together. And the one that I'm going to talk about most today is our Building Ecological Solutions to Coastal Community Hazards Project, which is one of those very long titles, so I just call it my Living Shorelines Projects. Um, <laughs> and that was really to put in living shorelines in different places in New Jersey. So one of the things that happens after coastal storms is we have to bring sand back to the beach areas. Uh, the Army Corps was responsible for bringing the sand back to our New Jersey beaches in most places. And so at Stevens, we didn't get much say in how that was going to be designed. That's really through that federal process. But what we get to do is study it after the sand has been put in place. So we look at different areas. We look at places that sand was placed. We look at different structures that are on the beach. Down in uh, um, Manuswan and uh, down by Deal, there are places where there are already sheet pile walls and there are rock walls that exist. So we look at how's the sand move in front of the wall? How's the sand move to the edge of the wall? Is there an effect right next to the wall? You're getting more or less erosion. And we study that over time. We give the reports back to the city officials, the state government, 
whoever is interested in these projects and working on these projects to let them know this is what we're seeing happening. So in this, these, uh, this way, we're really putting in the effort to figure out what are the coastal processes, how are they moving. So it's really like the bulk of the science aspect. Um, just to let you know, we do have <coughs> some interesting aspects about beach nourishment. So a lot of times you'll hear people say, and you'll see a lot of this after uh, Irma came through, is all the sand that was placed on our beaches has been washed away and it's gone. It's disappeared. Why do we waste all that money? And so one of the things that I like to tell people is that there's actually a lot of science, a lot of engineering and design that goes behind that. And so when the Army Corps is placing the sand on the beach, they have a template of where they want to put the, put the sand. So this line here is where they're saying we're going to put the sand. But they know that that sand is going to move over time. So they try to figure out in a year or two, where do we want the sand to eventually be? Because it's not going to stay in one place. It's dynamic. It moves around all the time. So they put it in one area, and it eventually moves to where the equilibrium profile wants it to be. Now, a lot of people, when they say we've lost all the sand off our beaches, they only look where the water is. So they look at where the water is and they say, oh, the sand is gone. But as, as scientists and engineers, when they're looking at where the beach is, they look all the way out underneath the water column, and they're looking at the sand that's all the way in this whole entire water column as part of the beach. So a lot of places you might be able to see sandbars. A lot of times they're most obvious because people are out there in the summer playing on them. So you know they're, they're pretty much exposed, but they're far out, so you know there's a sandbar. A lot of times when the sand moves, especially in the wintertime after a nor'easter, we don't know if there's a sandbar or not. So that's when we take our jet ski out and we do the bathymetry of the area to see where the sand has moved around and see if we can tell where the volume has changed and whether it's still in the system or it's far out to sea. So this is just one case study that we have of a beach tree nourishment project and a living shorelines project that took an area in Lower Cape May and it added sand to this area. See this divot right here? That area over there has a major loss of sand. And the different colors, it's hard to see, I know, from your seats, but the different colors are the different years. And basically, if you see where this blue line is here, and then the projected 2050 line, obviously, it's eroding away. So in order to fix that, they put sand there, and they re nourish the area. The next thing I wanted to talk to you about was the New Jersey Sea Grant Consortium's Dune Manual. So, there was not any manual on how to create our dunes that had been in publication. I think the last one was like the 1970s we were finding references for. So after Hurricane Sandy, we're going to put all this sand on the beach. We have to figure out how to create dunes if we're going to create dunes in certain areas. So what's the science behind it? What are some guides? What are some ways that we can do it so that we create our most stable environments on the beach in an ever-changing world? So New Jersey Sea Grant put together a bunch of the experts in the coastal world, uh, people that have experts in plant genetics, people that have experts in the engineering of the beaches, such as John. I got brought in as the ecologist, along with some other ecologists, Michael and Louise. And so we came together, we wrote our chapters, and we put together what we thought is the best way to design a dune, looking at how can a community make a difference. You have the, you have the engineers at the Army Corps of Engineers, they're coming up with their template, they're doing the federal project. There's not much that we can change about the federal project, but how can we go in at the citizen science or the, the local official level and say, we're going to make better dunes? So we did a lot of research looking at what has been said before, what are other research out there, doing basically our, our, your general reference search. We started writing up some of our ideas, but we wanted to get feedback from people in the community, people who are other experts but maybe weren't our authors. So we did workshops around the state of New Jersey, asked for feedback. We reached out to other academics and other government entities that might give feedback on the, this work. And eventually we ended up presenting this at a couple, of, um, a couple of conferences. The first one I was able to present it at was one down in North Carolina and got a lot of feedback from that. So we started out with our ideas, took it out to the public and the other experts out there and said, hey, what else can we do? How can we make this better? And eventually we came up with not only a online version of our manual, but we've also now printed out the hard copy of our manual. And these are the chapters. I'm not going to go through all of them in depth because it's a lot. <laughs> and um, 
If you're interested in something, then you can always go online and read up about it. So John and I, Dr. Miller and I, we really worked on the second chapter, the engineering of dunes, but we also edited and worked on all the other chapters too. So when you think of dunes in New Jersey, if you've been down to the beach, you might see that there aren't that many, there isn't much space for dunes to grow in between where the beach and the people lay their towels and where the houses and the roads start to begin. So the infrastructure at our coastline, we're such a developed coastline, is really limiting what our dunes can do. However, there still are some things that we can do even in that limited space. You know, if we didn't have any structures, this is a picture from a non-built um, non up area. I can't remember if that's Island Beach or if that's, uh, I think that might be Island Beach or it might be another area. But anyway, you can see how long these dunes would be created over the whole entire barrier island. So here would be the bay, that would be the beach, and the dunes would just fill in the back area if we didn't have our infrastructure there. However, normally what we see is more of an area like this. A beach here, and then we have a few areas of dunes right into the, um, into the structure of houses. So this is kind of your profile of a healthy beach and dune area with multiple dunes. You have, you call them primary, secondary, tertiary dunes, but most of the time we're lucky to even get the, the primary dune on many of our developed areas. So I mentioned some of these. There are those different scales of change, the long term, the seasonal, the episodic. So we took these into consideration when thinking about how we were going to build up our dunes, how we're going to protect those areas. But you're also looking at why are you creating dunes? Are you creating them to protect the sand? Are you creating them to protect the inlets? Are you creating them to protect the areas behind them? Um, and there are a lot of things that humans have done on the beaches to change our coastal areas over time. So the way we manage the beaches changes how the dunes exist on those areas. So we do have seasonal and coastal changes. As I mentioned, those nor'easters like to come through in the winter and that actually erodes away our dunes a significant amount and we'll tend to see really, really major steep slopes. This is a big slope here or what we call a scarp. And so that type of um, beach front area would not be good to lay on and recreate on. And a lot of people don't spend much time at the beach in the winter, so I'll hear people come down one day and they'll be like, oh my gosh, there's no beach in here anymore. I'm not gonna come here in the summer. All of our beaches are gone. What are we gonna do? But there's this very uh, predictable seasonal change where we have major erosion in the winter, and then during the summer, the winds die down, The the beaches get more, more relaxed, we get more, more accretion onto the beaches, and summer we'll see more of a gentle slope. And this is just a picture I had one winter at the beach where you can see that really distinct slope here, and the high tide line comes right up to where the snow ended there. We also have the storm surge, um, nor'easters, and then Sandy is one of the major ones. That brings a lot of water into the area at one time, moves the sand around. So if you had a natural beach area without infrastructure, that sand would be moved around, it would be kept in the system, and maybe eventually we'd get back on the beach. But anyone know what they did to all the sand that was in the streets after Hurricane Sandy? And what did they do with it? Anyone? No, Phil has to know. <laughs> well, uh, what did they do with the sand? I mean, mm -hmm. they, their choice would be to shovel it back onto the dunes, mm -hmm. you would hope. Um, they might push it into the back bay. They might throw it in the garbage. Yeah. I don't know. Different time periods, they did different things. So immediately after the storm, they were just shoveling it to get out of the way to get people back on the islands and to get them to be able to get back to their houses. Actually, to put the sand back on the beaches, it has to go through a filtration system because otherwise you have all this debris and all this stuff. So later on, they got into the process where they had a filter system. You actually could see them. Instead of nourishing it, like the pictures I showed where they're nourishing it from the ocean side, they're basically nourishing it from the beach side. But still, there was a lot of sand lost in that process because they had to get people back to their homes as fast as possible. So some of the things that we talk about in our manual in terms of what the town could do to manage their beaches better are things like setbacks. So a town could require houses to be a certain distance from the ocean, which would allow more of a dune to be created in front of it. Um, towns could also create different walkovers. So every time you have someone walking over the dune, you're creating a little dent in it. You're creating this area that will funnel energy, it'll funnel wind, it'll funnel water through there. 
So most places will have only walkovers at the street ends, um, public, public entrance areas at the street ends. But a lot of places people, you know, people don't like walking to the end of their, down, down their street one way or the other. So they'll create their own little pathways into the dunes. And every time they do that, that just creates a little bit more of an instability in the dune. Um, so there's different types of walkovers. And there, these are just some that might be more uh, efficient and more stable for the dunes. So elevated pathway over the dune area, limited walkovers at street ends and not allowing them in front of every single house. Some places have removable walkovers so you can take them out in the winter and let some of that sand and come back into place. Um, other places have curved their walkovers so that it doesn't just funnel the wind and the water straight back into the beach area or straight back into the streets, but it will actually curve around so the wind, as it's blowing the sand, it'll get trapped into the fences. Um, another thing that towns can decide on is what type of dune fencing do they want. So there's two major types of dune fencing that we often see. One is this dune fencing pretty close together. It traps the sand and over time that dune fence should get covered up. It should create better dunes and it should cause the dunes to eventually accrete and then you'll need to put another dune fence in later. Uh, another one is more of a symbolic dune fence which are these wooden rails. And a lot of towns do that just to try and keep people out of the dunes. However, it allows a wildlife to move around the dunes a lot easier. So sometimes that's a situation that you might want to have. And then towns can also decide if there's some type of combination of structures that they want. Armoring, um, in general, pretty much found that armoring in just by itself leaves the beaches really de depleted of sand. But if you combine it with some type of other process, um, these are called geotubes here, and they're armored processes that are supposed to be covered with sand and then create these artificial dune systems. This is a sheet pile wall that's put really far down in the ground to stabilize the sand, but then it's covered with more sand so that you don't see it and you have this image of a natural beach area. Sea walls are, a lot of your hard structures were put in like the 1960s and 70s, and they've really been found that they just don't leave any beach left. So if it's your last line of defense and it's the last thing you need to do before your house has fallen, it might be what a town needs to do. But most of the time that is not encouraged anymore because there's so much value in having a beach where people can sit and recreate and play with their kids. And then of course beach nourishment that we already touched upon. Other things that the manual talks about is where should different plants be planted. Um, it's easy to look at a beach and say, oh, it's all the same plant there. Um, but as you can see, just with the different colorations in this picture, there are different plants that are supposed to be in different niches of the beach. So what plants should be where, and what plants should we try planting in places? Also, as different plants grow, their roots grow in different directions. Some grow straight down, some grow sideways. This creates a nice web to trap in the sand um, and helps to create a more stable environment. Uh, a lot of times, uh, the Army Corps is just required to plant American beach grass, which is just one type of grass. It's easy, it, it's really cheap, it's genetically replicated over and over again. Um, it's very easy, you can send Girl Scouts and kids out there with a pole and they can just plant it. So, not hard at all, but it's not the best for the ecology. So, we try to put into a lot of people's minds that there's more plants than just American beach grass. We also have to think about the animals. So there's a lot of cool animals that live on the dunes. Some of these are pictures from my friends down in uh, Holgate and Long Beach Island. So snowy owls come in, seals come and rest on the beaches. We have endangered species, different birds that are out there. Uh, these are the piping plovers, and this is their little nest with one egg in there. And you can see how camouflaged they are. So we have to think about them when we're putting in our dunes. Can we attract something like the monarch butterflies? That's a really big tourist attraction, but it's also a really good dune species. It's native. Uh, this one, I think this one's the goldenrod, but the milkweed is the really, the goldenrod attracts the butterflies, but they say it's kind of like sugar for them. It's like eating a popsicle. Whereas if you bring in the milkweed, that's like the really nutritious plant for them. So what type of species are we considering when we're planting our dunes? And then we have to think about, again, primary dunes. This is the American beach grass, really easy to plant. But when you get back in your secondary dunes, if you're trying to re-nourish and plant them, you might want some more different species that will live better in those areas. They get better. They get different types of sunlight, different types of salt spray, and different types of covering by the sand. So they all react differently. 
So from this project, we were able to create an online version, a hard copy version. Um, we also created keep off the dune signs. And we had a pilot project started down in Cape May. The mayor down there was very helpful, and he allowed us to come in and start planting a variety of species down in one of his dune areas where he wanted it to be renourished and revegetated. So we were able to do this with this project, and also a lot of people have bought the dune manuals and gotten that information out. So now I want to move into the Living Shoreline Project, and this is the why it was brought on. Dunes and, and renourishment are just one type of living shoreline, but we work on a lot of other living shorelines. So sometimes with the term living shoreline, it's kind of hard to really define it. Um, I actually tried to look up online and see what is a living shoreline once, and I got so many different definitions. So there's a lot of things that you might hear that may be living shorelines or may not be. So you might hear terms like gray infrastructure. Usually that's dealing with storm water. You might hear green infrastructure, which could be a living shoreline if it's at the coast, but if it's somewhere inland, then it might not be a living shoreline. It just might be a green roof or something else, but it also has those same characteristics of creating habitat in an area. One of the terms that seems to be picked up a lot, and a lot of times it's just based on what our grants are calling it. So if the National Wildlife Foundation is calling it something or the Department of Environmental uh, or the Department of Environmental Protection happens to have a grant that's calling it something, that's what we start calling it. So um, NNBF or natural, nature, natural and nature-based features or solutions was a big one like a year ago. Um, ecologically enhanced shorelines. So there's tons of different terminology. So I don't want you to get hung up on it. Um, I don't want you to worry like, oh, she was talking about something, but it sounds like this. They're all kind of under the same big umbrella. Sometimes it's easier to think what is not a living shoreline, and that's easier to define it. If you just have a hard physical structure with the only primary goal being that it's going to keep that area completely stable, but not worrying about what habitat it creates, that is not a living shoreline. So things that you might see are hard walls made of wood. You might see uh, dikes or groins. You might see seawalls or just um, rocks structures like these breakwaters that don't incorporate, incorporate any of the ecology into it. Those are not living shorelines. Once you start adding plants or you start moving the rocks around to create little nooks and crannies to create a habitat, it starts to become a living shoreline. So there's a very fine line. Um, sometimes we joke like, oh, if you have a bulkhead like that and you put a, a, a flower and a pot on there, is it now a living shoreline? <laughs> Probably not if you're going for a grant for that. So, you have to kind of see what types of things actually fall under the category. So here are just some basic definitions, basic things that living shorelines are doing. They are usually stabilization alternatives. So a little bit alternating, a little bit changing from what you might have traditionally seen. We see them a lot in our estuaries, in our bays, in our marsh areas. Um, Right now in New Jersey, we're seeing just a lot of beach nourishment going on on the beaches, so where our focus is really on our marshes and our estuaries. Uh, you have both natural and man-made materials. So this is not a completely green project, but it has the, the man-made materials too. Creates a little bit more stability in the areas. And there's a lot of variety to them because so much stuff is still being designed and we're still learning from every different project. So no two projects are really alike, and they're constantly trying to change and learn from the previous project that, that has been implemented. There are a lot of different areas, though, even though we're focusing mainly on our marshes and our bays, there are tons of different areas that these projects can go in. Um, and this slide shows one way that someone broke down all of the different types of coastal habitats that exist out there. So I know you can't read all that, it's very small up there, but basically you can just see all the variety and all the colors on there. All the parameters and characteristics of the different living shorelines. So I obviously can't tell you about every single one of these in an hour, but just keep that in mind that there's a lot of variety that goes into these projects. And I'm going to tell you about a few, but each project needs to be taken to the environment it's going to be put in and needs to be actually worked out in the actual environment to figure out whether or not it's going to work there, whether or not alternatives need to be made, whether or not we have to just adjust it a little bit. A lot of things are, can be questioned when you're looking at a living shoreline. Is it appropriate in a certain area? What are your goals? 
how are you going to get these products there? So some of our places are pretty remote and far out, and there's no roads there. There's no way to really get there easily. I walked out on some of these marsh areas where you're sinking deep down in your mud, and now you're talking about bringing these huge boulders out there to create a living shoreline. How are you going to get that there? So there's a lot of questions that have to be thought about before you end up actually designing and implementing your living shoreline. Um, some places they might not be appropriate, and it's not a one-off one fix. It's not going to be something that you can put in everywhere, but hopefully these types of methods can be used in many places to create a better method of stabilizing our coastal areas. So these are just some of the types that you'll see, some types of living shoreline alternatives. Uh, sometimes they kind of overlap, right? So a lot of them have a lot of the same products, a lot of the same types of materials. Uh, so I remember when I first started eating Mexican food. Anyone here ever go out and get Mexican food, right? And you got burritos, enchiladas, tacos. They're pretty much all the same ingredients, just put in different orders, right? One has the cheese on top, one has the cheese in the middle. And some of these are very similar to that. One has the plants on top, one has the plants in the back. One has the rocks that are bigger, one has the rocks that are smaller. So it's not very distinct all the time which one is, is you know, going to be the most appropriate or which one, how to actually describe it. So you can see that there's a lot of similarities between them, but they are slightly different just based on the environment that they're being used in. So we'll go through a couple that are appropriate in certain areas. So when we go into the marshes, one of the things that we are commonly seeing as a living shoreline is what's called uh, coconut fibers and marsh planting. So these are core rolls or coconut fiber rolls, and they're basically a mesh that they get wet and they have the ability to let the plant's roots grow through. They're really, really heavy, and so they stabilize the area, and we can put posts in to stabilize them, and this is uh, Danielle Kruger from uh, the Partnership of Delaware Ashore, she's one of the gurus of living shorelines, and her group says that the best way to do it is to crisscross ropes on top of it to keep it down. Now what they did at this project in Delaware, they actually found plants and put them in here, and they planted the in-between spots. So this one would be a, a planted, planted revetment, um, and so the planted revetment with the core fiber logs would create this really nice stable area, allowing the marshes behind to be protected while creating a new area of marsh plants here in front of it. We also have ones called living reefs, and these can be made by a couple of different projects. We have one method is to take oyster shells or clam shells and take the shells, bag them up, and create these big heavy bags that are basically like boulders, and make a reef out of them. The um, thing that's great about oyster shells is oysters love to grow on shells. So oysters will grow on other shells of the dead oysters or dead whelks or dead clams. And so over time, you can have a living shoreline that has a whole bunch of live oysters on there. It's awesome because if our sea level keeps rising, the oysters can keep colonizing and keep rising up and keep pace with the oysters or with the sea level rise. Uh, we also have things that are called, called oyster castles. So they look like big Lego logs. They fit together. And they're made of a cement that allows them to attract different types of sessile organisms, mainly your oysters again. But they get these cool little tunicates on them. They're called sea squirts. So we were making uh, oyster castles one day, and all these sea squirts were already growing on them, so we were squirting each other with them. So you can have some fun while you're doing that. Uh, reef balls are one that we don't do a lot here. They're more do done um, down in like tropical areas for some reason. It just seems to be reef ball is, is uh, kind of like a brand name. Um, we seem to be going more towards the oyster castles. The reef balls are really uh, a lot more expensive and a lot harder to move around from place to place. One of the interesting things is that well, a lot of these areas, we want to worry about water quality also, and oysters are a great creature to actually filter out our water, uh, all the pollutants in the water, and create better water quality. However, in New Jersey, we have a ban on, on it's called seeding, when you put the oysters, the small spat of the oysters, when you actually put them in the water. We're not allowed to put the oysters in the water because the water's not clean enough to grow the oysters because the government is afraid that someone will accidentally eat it, get sick, and ruin the whole entire oyster harvesting industry. 
But if we put the oysters in there, the water would be cleaner and we'd have better water quality. So the way we get around it is putting the dead oyster shells in there and hoping the oysters just colonize it ourselves, to colonize it themselves. This is another project down with the, um, the Partnership of Delaware Estuary, just showing some examples of before and after. So this is before the project and, the, oops, and what they implemented. And then this is after, and you can see how much vegetation is there and how much more of a stable environment that is. This is a sill. So again, we have rocks. They're spaced out to be terraced down in this boat ramp here. And so over time, this will allow the sand not to be washed away. It'll allow the plants to grow in here. And I actually was just back at the site a couple weeks ago and you can hardly see any of the rocks there anymore because the vegetation has come in and um, really filled in in those areas. So the still, like I said, again, you have rocks, you have plants. The other one, you have plants and you have rocks. So similar different types, similar um, ingredients, just a different way of putting them together. This is a case study of one of the sills that was implemented on the Hudson River project. And so you can see this is kind of what this area looked like before. Not really pretty, not some place you really want to hang out. And now the sill is placed out over here. And so we were out here a couple weeks ago and now this area doesn't flood as much because you have a lot more accretion of sand in that place. And this is the boat ramp. This was the first picture that I had. And again, that's where all the plants have grown in. And so this is what it looks like later on in the year after it's already been established. So breakwaters is another type of living shoreline. It's put out into the ocean. And you can see here that it's literally kind of a tea head groin coming off. But usually there's, sometimes there um, are gaps and sometimes there's a pathway out there. These are different than a hard structure because when they put them together, they make sure that there's still room for the water to move through or the sand to move through, so you're creating that habitat again. Again, rock barrier. This is a revetment, pretty much like a, uh, like a breakwater, except for it is flush against the shoreline instead of being offshore, and the sill is usually further inside, and then the breakwater, or the revetment goes right along, along the area where the water is coming into the land. And you can also plant in here, so plant within the joints, plant within the holes so you can get some more vegetation. And a lot of these are part of a hybrid structure, so we're combining different uh, living shorelines together. So usually there might be a breakwater with a sill, and so a lot of com combining these different forms. One of the things that is kind of an up and coming um, living shoreline conflict concept is to do these projects in more urban areas. So it's great that we have really open space that we can put these projects in, but what about doing this along areas that are already in urban centers? So how can we create a shoreline that is a little bit more environmental? Kind of like when you add green roofs to an area, well, we're just adding green stuff to our local shoreline areas. Sometimes they do little tide pools like this, create a little uh, concrete thing that will help hold in some water and create a habitat or a tide pool. A lot of times what they'll do is try and add some texture to the side because animals like to grip on the texture. Something really straight and flat, nothing's going to grow on, but you add some texture to the side of the wall and then maybe you start seeing some growth. This is one of the case studies from this project called Designing the Edge and it was in New York City and you can see this is how, that's not a great picture of it, but they did a variety of different structures to design a park system and a, a little an area here that has a little tide pool to allow fish and animals in there. It can allow birds to hunt in there, a lot of planting in there. So rather than just having a bulkhead or a solid structure of concrete, they created that environment in this space. These are all of the different living shoreline projects that we've been involved with during the time I've been here at, Texas, or at Stevens Institute. So you can just see that there is a lot going on in this field. It is one of the up and coming uh, ways of stabilizing our shorelines. We have a new general permit that allows us to continue to create these projects, implement them easier. So I didn't go over all of these because we don't have enough time and I bore you all. But <laughs> if you're ever interested, you can look up some of these projects or ask me about more of them later. 
This is the one project that I said had that long title in the NIFWIF uh, Living Shorelines project. And these are just all the different municipalities down here and all the different uh, towns that we worked with to try and get them to be more uh, stable and have more environmental enhancement. Right now what we've been working on a lot this summer is uh, working with this group from the Cary Institute is called a monitoring protocol. So short, living shorelines have been going in, but there still lacks this evidence of are they working, are they functioning, how are we going to measure this stuff. And measures and monitoring work groups are being put together to try and figure out what is the best way to go back and judge year after year whether or not they're working. So just for an example, we took one of those structures, the sill, and we thought about how is it functioning, what's the integrity of it. We came up with parameters and we came up with methods to go out and test them. This summer we've been going out and doing baseline studies of these sites and we've also been trying to train citizen scientists. So some of them are at parks or at boat ramps. So we find local people that are like an hour or two hours away. So we're trying to find local groups that will be willing to come and do these projects and continue to look at whether or not these shorelines are working or not. There are a lot of online resources. If anyone's ever interested, probably my favorite is our flood advisory system here down at Stevens. Um, but lots of different researches and online resources are out there to learn about these processes, learn about coastal storms, learn about what's going on in your environment right now. Learn about ways that your town could get help. Um, if you wanted to put in a living shoreline, the Restoration Explorer is one that we worked on that's a really good resource. I have this one bookmarked on my phone. I look at it every day because I, besides being up here, I live in Long Beach Island and we get flooded all the time. So I have to see where my floodwaters are, whether or not I'm in my car. And the one day I didn't, guess what? My car got flooded and it's been in the shop and it is actually out of commission now. So I'm constantly paying attention to this stuff. These are the living shorelines that New Jersey DEP hired Stevens to put together and come up with a, a way to say, hey, we have this area that we want to put a shoreline, put a living shoreline in. Would it be a good spot for a shoreline or not? What shorelines would be applicable there? So we came up with a bunch of parameters. Again, these are small, don't try to memorize them. And then we came up with a bunch of criteria and we said, well, if you wanted to create a marsh still, you should have a very uh, low to medium erosion history. So these types of guidelines are what has helped with a lot of the general permitting and they also help to create the Nature Conservancy's Restoration Explorer. So these guidelines were taken and they were put into this tool. It's an online tool open to the public. And what you can do is you can pull up an area and you can say, hey, I live here, which I actually do. That's why I live in Long Beach Island. Um, and you can say, I want to stabilize my area so my car doesn't get flooded. What living shorelines would be appropriate in these areas? And this is green, so it tells me uh, four out of the five techniques would actually be appropriate there. I could go to my town and say, hey, I want to start stabilizing this area. Here are some options that might work for you. Here's what the Stevens engineering guidelines say would work, and let's get this done. Um, so it's a tool that's out there and can really help communities to figure out where these spots should be put in. Again, this was the dune manual that we created and the rip currents uh, sign that we also give out to towns. This is actually the rip current, rip current sign and the dune, keep off the dune signs that we give to towns to, through New Jersey Sea Grant so that they can educate their public, so they can give them more understanding of why you keep off the dunes. It's not just because someone said so, you know, your mom said don't go on the dunes, so don't go on there. It's because that's an environment, it's an ecosystem, we want to protect it because it helps protect our homes. So this is just some information about me. I'll leave this up here and uh, if anyone wants to get in contact with me, that is my uh, email up there. Just feel free to email me and I can stick around and I am uh, good for questions, so leave it off to Dibs. <laughs>